Okay, I had to do it. I had to make a video like this, dude. There's nothing in the news to talk about with the Canucks, at least at the time of recording this audio, which is December 25th, 4.41pm PST. There's just so much to be thankful for. You know, when it comes to the Canucks, there are just so many topics that you can go out there and highlight with this team. Obviously, Bruce Boudreaux is the big one that we have highlighted in several videos in the past, but I wanted to talk about JT Miller. Because when it comes to the Canucks and the way that they've been putting up points, you know, there are a lot of really good players on this team. Bo has been heating up recently. Connor Garland has been good all year. We're starting to see Brock Besser get his shot back and everything. But ultimately, the guy who's been driving the ship, point production-wise at least, has been none other than that JT Miller. Here, I'll try to articulate this point. So, Bo Horvat. Take a look at how good Bo has been this season. 19 points in 31 games played. Really not the best compared to what we know Horvat is capable of, but of course, a lot of that production has come in the past few games, so it's good to see him get back on the score sheet. Brock, same thing, 17 points, 28 games. Elias Pettersson, he's slowly, slowly getting his groove back. I don't want to say he's there yet, but he's slowly getting there. He's at 16 points in 31 games played. Heck, even Connor Garland, who has been good all year. 22 points, 31 games played. JT Miller has more assists then all of these players have points individually. JT Miller has 22 assists, which is the same amount of total points as Connor Garland, and it's a higher number than Bo, Brock, EP, Hoaglander, Pearson, and everybody else in their point production. JT Miller also has 10 goals, leading the team on top of that, tied, obviously, with Bo. JT Miller, in 31 games played this season, has 32 points, and he is coming off a stretch where in the past nine games, the guy has gone out there with a total of 13 points. In the Vancouver Canucks six-game win streak, Miller has gone out there with a point in every single one, getting two points against the Kings and three against the San Jose Sharks. He went pointless in the Pittsburgh game, yes, but against Ottawa, three points right there. Against Montreal, he had himself another point. He had a slow, slow stretch from the Chicago game to Boston at the end of November there, but before that, I mean, even taking a look at the start of November, New York two points, Nashville a point, Dallas two goals, and then you have points in four straight games, even though the Vancouver Canucks went out there and lost against Anaheim, Colorado, Vegas, and then Anaheim again. In those Anaheim and Colorado games, the Canucks only scored one goal each, and Miller had points on both of them. So, He's gone out there as an absolute clutch player, putting up the points when the team needs him to, and it's at this point where you start thinking, okay, is it the trade conversation Lego wants to go down? Do you want to talk about trading this guy? Honestly, I don't even care. Like, it gets to a point now where if you keep Miller on the team, you have yourselves a win because you have a guy like JT Miller on your team because this guy who is 28 years old, he's making $5.25 million, he expires next year, so he's got another season under his belt. Assuming Bruce Boudreaux goes out there and does his magic for an entire season next year, it's going to be crazy how good JT Miller can be if, of course, you know, Pedersen and Besser and Horvat and everybody else can be as good as they can be consistently throughout the season too, but if you want to go down the trading JT Miller conversation, then there is a pretty big win to be had there as well, because come on, JT Miller was acquired by Jim Benning in the Tampa Bay trade during the 2019 draft, I believe it was day two, and that was seen as a pretty big significant move. It was Marek Mazanich, the goaltender, a third-round pick, and a conditional Vancouver Canucks first that had draft lottery protection, or not draft lottery protection, playoff protection. If the Vancouver Canucks made the playoffs, then the pick would go over, but if they didn't, it would be the Canucks' first-round pick from the next season that would go over to Tampa Bay instead. Eventually, it was sent over to New Jersey because Tampa traded away that pick that they acquired from Vancouver in the Blake Coleman trade, but... For JT Miller, when the Vancouver Canucks acquired him back in 2019, it was seen as a pretty dangerous move. Like, I liked it at the time, and even though I was a big fan of the move, which a lot of people like to dispute, by the way, a lot of people like to say, oh, Miller, you didn't like the Miller trade, Lego. Um, you're wrong about that. Just go watch the video. I liked it back when it was made. The thing is, even though it was a trade that I liked, it definitely wasn't the safest trade, in my opinion. 
I thought that Miller would be this 50-point guy, you know, he's going to go to Vancouver and play top-line minutes, be a winger for Bo Horvat or whatever, and he's going to have himself a 50, 55, 60-point stretch as a Canucks guy in 82 games played. Because that's kind of what he was in Tampa Bay. He was a good player for New York, sent over to Tampa Bay, but playing in a limited role in the bottom of their lineup, he wasn't really able to produce as much as he could have, but he still produced somewhat. You take a look at the Miller point production in his days with the Lightning, he had 47 points in 75 games played in a very limited role, so it's definitely not a bad stat line for a guy in the middle six. But heading over to Vancouver, even though he was going to get better minutes in Vancouver, I was like, okay, the Canucks are a bad team, they're a lot worse than Tampa, so even though Miller might get more ice time here, he's playing on a worse team, so it kind of balances itself out, I think he probably could get 50-60 points on the Vancouver Canucks. Nope, I was wrong, he got 70, 72 points in 69 games played, do the math on that, 72, Divi 69, very nice number, multiplied out by 82, on pace for 86 points. The Vancouver Canucks have not had an 80-point score since the gosh darn Sedins, like 10 years ago. That was 10 years ago, my goodness. And Miller came out here and he did that. He was just so strong on the puck. Sure, his temper would get the best out of him once in a while, but at the end of the day, if he comes out with points every other game and the occasional three, four-point game he would post up, it was kind of okay. And last season, on a depleted Vancouver Canucks team, he still had 46 points in 53 games played. Now he's at 32 points in 31 games with an extraordinary game log to boot. The guy has just gotten his groove back. And it's kind of funny because he's one of the guys that I think a lot of Canucks fans, whenever they see him in the offensive zone, sure, he does a really dangerous, risky play once in a while that causes a turnover, but when he does things properly... He's setting up Bo Horvat with cross-crease passes, tape to tape, and getting things off perfectly. When he's doing things right, he's getting one-timers, a go to the net. He is like the Elias Pettersson replacement on that side on the power play. There's a reason why PD is on power play two now, and Miller is still on power play one doing his thing. Hughes is going out there feeding this guy. They have just been such a joy to watch. The chemistry between these two American players is abnormal, and we're just kind of robbed about that when it comes to the Olympics, so very unfortunate to see. But still, when it comes to JT Miller and the way that he's been playing, it's really tough to try to label just what particular trait makes him so good. It's the combination of his ability to protect the puck when he's coming in through the fenders and trying to fight his way to the front of the goal. It's the combination of skills that he has when he has the puck on his stick. It's the very, very clear passion that he has for the game in mentoring guys that are underneath him and trying to make sure that everybody is the best that they can be. Talking to Elias Pettersson whenever he's taking one-timers, telling him, okay, higher, gotta go lower, gotta go faster, gotta go stronger. Okay, there you go. That's a good one right there. You talk about how all the Canucks guys that do the media interviews... They're all saying the same thing about this guy, and they've been saying the same thing about Miller the past few years. Yeah, he's very talkative. He's very loud, and he is not afraid to go out there and tell you what he thinks. This is the kind of personality that I really think forms well with a coach like Bruce Boudreau, and not to say that Miller wasn't producing under Travis Green, but there's just somewhat of a different step that has been unlocked, not just in Miller's game, but in everybody else's game around him. When JT Miller is playing his best, he is making everybody else get better opportunities too, and he's making some good plays out there. So this has been a very, very positive relationship for a lot of the players on the team involved, which is why, to me, you know, if you keep a guy like Miller, your team is better with him than without him. Like, that is very clear at this point. The only reason you would trade a Miller is because you want to build for the future and you want to salvage what would be the last parts of his contract because you're not sure if he would want to resign and this and that. So if you trade away a Miller, you're probably going to get some very significant value coming back the other way, probably more so than what the Canucks sent away in the initial trade to get Miller in the first place back in 2019, because now that he's gotten that spotlight to play on a Canucks team that is this bad and he's still doing this well... There's a lot more of an incentive, in my opinion, to say, yeah, he's probably going to get you more than a third-string goaltender, a third-round pick, and a first. So it depends on where Rutherford wants to go with this team. At the end of the day, you want more guys like Miller on your team, not less. But if you do end up trading this guy away, you're going to get yourselves a haul. It really depends on the direction the Canucks decide to go down. But right now, I mean, what's there not to like about this? 
JT Miller's going out there doing his thing. Bo Horvat's going out there doing his thing. Bruce Boudreaux is at the helm. He's controlling this team in a way that Travis Green has not been able to do since probably the 2019, or excuse me, the 2020 bubble. So talk to me in the comments. What do you think about this entire conversation over here about JT Miller and the way that he's played for the Canucks? He's an absolute monster, I tell you. Let me know in the comments all your thoughts. Should you trade him? Should you let him go? Should you keep him around? Try to re-sign him? Make him retire a Canuck? There are so many options to go down here, but I want to hear your opinions in the comments. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, Trolls and I and I and bye.